Hello, I'm JW. Uh, this time we're having a look at earth loop impedance testing as part of the series on testing. And in terms of what an earth loop impedance actually is, well, I've already done a video on that, so of course links will be in the usual place. Uh, this time we're just going to have a look at the actual procedure involved in actually carrying out the test. Now the main reason for doing this test is to ensure that the earth connection is actually connected to something and it has a suitably low impedance so that uh, protective devices like circuit breakers and fuses will actually disconnect the circuit in the event of a fault. As if it's too high then of course things can either just take too long to disconnect or in extreme cases never actually disconnect at all leaving things in a dangerous state. And typically the earth connection is provided by the electricity company although in some instances it may be from an earth electrode or earth rod outside in the ground but the uh, procedure for testing this is pretty much the same in both cases. Now in the case of this test we're actually concerned with the external earth fault loop impedance and this is typically given the symbol Z for impedance and then E and E for external so this is purely the effectiveness of the earth connection that's being provided to the building and does not involve the circuits within the building at all and you can of course uh, test the circuits inside the building that would be when it was given the symbol ZS and that's the thing we do at the end of each circuit and of course it's just the uh, the resistance of the circuit wiring added to the external loop impedance. But uh, we're talking about the external one here which is the uh, external connection to earth they normally provided by the electricity supplier or it could be an earth electrode in the ground. Now here's a fairly typical sort of arrangement. Now we've got the uh, power coming in here the uh, surpass fuse and the connection for the neutral electricity meter and again, the wires just go straight in there with the line and neutral and in this case we've got a separate isolator here this could be part of the consumer unit or in this case a separate uh, thing we've drawn here and so this can be used just to disconnect power to the whole installation and then in this case we've got the wires just going over would go to your consumer unit or whatever and the earth in this case is a separate bar here again that could be part of the consumer unit or contained inside of it doesn't particularly matter. I've done it separately here so it's easier to show. And of course connected to here you're going to have uh, the wire going across to your consumer unit and the uh, thing for the installation. And you're probably also going to have wires for your main bonding which will be things such as gas pipes and water pipes and possibly other things as well if you have oil spies or whatever and uh, structural metalwork and all that other kind of stuff. So there will be quite a few wires connected in here and the earth wire of course itself will either come from the uh, supplier's cutout here with the combined with the neutral possibly from the actual cable itself if it's an older installation or in some cases actually from a rod in the ground that you have to provide yourself. And in this case let's just show it coming from the uh, cable there and that will come across and go into the earthing bar like that. Now in order to test this what we need to do is to only test this piece here and the external earth connection. So we need to actually disconnect this from the actual earth bar here because we don't want to test like this because if we did not only have we got additional paths to the gas and water and bearing in mind these are probably metal pipes buried in the ground so it's going to have a fairly good connection and you've also got the one going to the consumer unit and the other circuits and if you've got things like uh, boilers or electric uh, water heaters or whatever fairly likely that's going to be connected to ground at some point as well. So we've got all of these parallel paths so just testing it in this condition isn't really going to tell you anything because it could be that this is perfectly fine or it could be you're just actually measuring via the metal pipes in the ground or various other pathways throughout other areas in the building. So this needs to be disconnected but before doing this because obviously we're going to be taking the main earth away from the installation we need to make sure that the main switch, in this case here, is in the off position because obviously if it isn't then we're going to have an installation that's energised and no earth connection which of course is extremely dangerous. So the very first thing to do is to make sure the installation is turned off and the power is completely disconnected. And again this could be separate or part of the consumer unit. doesn't actually matter which one it is. When you've turned it off then you're going to basically disconnect this cable here so you're going to be unscrewing it from that or in some cases you may have an actual link there which you can disconnect one end from the other. So all you'll be left with is simply the wire coming out of here with a loose end and no connection to the rest of the installation whatsoever. Now instead of actually doing the test you'll use a piece of equipment specifically designed for the purpose as in an 
loop impedance tester, or more likely these days it will be combined with a multifunction test machine. And it's simply a question of getting the piece of test equipment. Let's we'll draw that in here. And this will typically be a two-wire type of connection. In some cases they have three, but uh, for this one the uh, two-wire connection is uh, generally what you would need. So you've got two test leads. One test lead will connect to the earthing wire we've got here, which we'll just goes straight to the means of earthing there. And then the other one needs to connect to a source of power. And in this case, all we're going to have left is the incoming terminal on the main isolator. Bearing in mind that it's all disconnected here, not energised. So it's the other wire from here, which will go across to the incoming supply there. And then it's a question of just pressing the button on the device and uh, reading off whatever it displays. Now once you've actually done this, the uh, next procedure of course is to uh, remove the test equipment. And before doing anything else, you need to reconnect this here. So it actually goes back into the main earthing terminal. And only when you've done this, you can then switch on the power and of course uh, the installation can then be used as it was previously. It's absolutely vital that this is reconnected because if you left it undone, you've basically confirmed that the earth is all good and proper, but then it's not actually connected to the installation, so it may as well not exist. So uh, switching off the power first. Two is disconnect. the earth conductor, then you can do your test, and then in reverse you're needing to reconnect the earth conductor, and then finally you can turn the power on as it was previously. Now in terms of what sort of values you should be getting, uh, impedance is measured in ohms, as it's a kind of resistance, although we're not uh, directly covered there. Again, we've gone into that in more detail in the other video. But uh, depending on the type of earth you have, the values you want to see are within these sort of ranges. So if you have a TNS supply, and that's what we had previously with the separate conductor basically being the outer covering of the cable, then uh, the external impedance, or ZE, should be less than 0.8 ohms. If it's a TNCS, and that's where the earth and neutral are combined on the supply cable, so it's only split basically when it comes into the building, then again, same ZE there, typical value would be less than 0.35 ohms. And note this is considerably lower, mainly because you would expect it to be lower because you're using the same conductor as the neutral, and of course so that's going to be considerably lower resistance than say the outer say steel or lead covering of some cable that's 50 years old. So those are fairly typical values. In some cases it can be more than this, but again you should check with the electricity supplier to see if that's a normal situation. But certainly anything that's uh, considerably greater than these does indicate there's some kind of fault, and you need to contact the electricity supplier to find out what that is and repair that. Now the third circumstance is the TT type of system, and this is where you have your earth electrode in the ground, which you would have to install yourself. So in the case of that ZE, generally you will be looking in the region of 100 ohms. In theory it can be a lot higher, but in reality anything above about 100 is likely to be somewhat unstable and not something you can generally rely on to keep that way into the future, because bearing in mind things like how much rain there's been recently and all kinds of other factors can affect this considerably. So generally in the sort of 100 ohms or less would be considered acceptable. And again, if this turned out to be massively high, then it suggests that the earth electrode has not been installed correctly, or there's some problem with where it is installed. For example, if you've got very dry, sandy soil, a single electrode in the ground is not likely to be sufficient. And of course you may then add, say, additional ones, or put them deeper into the ground, or in some cases actually install a different type of thing altogether, such as a metal mesh or grid under the ground or whatever else is suitable. But uh, most installations will have an earth uh, supplied from the electricity company. It's uh, fairly unlikely in Britain you'd need to have a TT supply, certainly on a new installation. Now something else we can determine at the same time as doing this test, and in fact many uh, modern test equipment will actually display this on the thing for you, is the uh, prospective fault current. And in other words, uh, 
the kind of current which would flow if there was a direct short between line and earth. Now, uh, of course, this is only going to be some kind of estimate because we're not going to be shorting it there just to see how much current flows, as that would cause a dangerous explosion and things might set on fire. But uh, because you're measuring the external impedance, you can easily calculate the estimate of what the fault current would be if that kind of fault would occur. And uh, say in many cases, uh, modern test equipment will actually do this on the display for you. And if not, it's a pretty easy thing to work out. So as we've seen previously, uh, V equals IR. And in the case of this, we already know what the R is because that's the uh, external impedance, which we've obviously seen. And the voltage can either be measured simply by attaching the voltmeter between the earth and the line conductor. And typically you would find, say, voltage in the region of sort of 240 volts in the UK. Theoretically it's 230, but uh, reality is not necessarily the same as theory. And we can just rearrange that as we've done in another video. So it's simply the voltage divided by the resistance, or in this case the impedance, and that will give us the current in amps. So in this case we'll say we've got 240, and uh, say we measured the external impedance as say something like 0.1. That makes the uh, calculations easy. So 240 divided by 0.1 ohms, that will give us a total of 2400, or in other words 2.4 kiloamps or Ka. Now this particular value isn't desperately relevant on most installations, particularly uh, domestic ones. In reality you're not going to get anything much below 0.1 ohm simply due to the fact of the cables and things that supply buildings are relatively small in fact and have a certain resistance anyhow. But uh, it can be useful and there is a space on the certificates to fill this in. And another factor here is that if you just measure it between, as we did previously, with the uh, earthing disconnected, you will get one value. However, it is useful to actually do that test again once you've reconnected the earth there. First of all, to make sure it is actually connected again. And also, because you've got those parallel paths that we saw on the previous page, and you've got your parallel paths, say, to your gas and water and other services, this has the effect, in many cases, of reducing the uh, actual earth impedance that you can measure, because bearing in mind this is just a single connection to the earth, but all of these are probably metal pipes buried in the ground as well, so they will just serve to reduce that even further. So if you're going to measure this, you can obviously measure it at the same time as doing the single test with the earth connection, and say so it's usually displayed on the meter anyhow. But then if you reconnect here, you can actually do the test again by simply just connecting that in and test lead goes to the main earthing terminal. That may well give you a slightly lower value, and in turn that will mean that this is going to be slightly higher, and it gives you a sort of a more relevant indication of what would happen in the event of a real fault. Because of course if a real fault occurs, all that bonding and stuff is going to be connected and in place. Now as well as the fault current between line and earth, you do also need to consider the fault current which could occur if there was a fault between line and neutral. And to test that it's exactly the same procedure, same device is used except you would test between the line and rather than the earth you would just test between the neutral of the incoming supply. Now depending on what kind of supply you have, this could actually be the same value as you get for the one for the earth. So for example on the TNCS supply, the cable you're testing is actually the same one because it's the neutral and earth are combined. So in that case you would expect the uh, fault current to be exactly the same. However on a TNS system as we've got here, then the uh, actual loop impedance between line and neutral is simply going to be quite a lot less than it would be between line and earth. And then the uh, current will actually be considerably higher. And definitely on a TT system, it of course will be considerably higher there. So as well as testing there, you do need to, once you've done this, test between the line and neutral. And whichever value is highest for the fault current is the one that you would record. So in terms of the uh, perspective fault current, you would test between the line and earth, and then also between the line and neutral. And whichever came up to be the largest current, and of course that would also mean the smallest impedance, would be the value we'd record for the prospective fault current. And so on a TNCS system you would expect those to be exactly the same, because of course you're testing the same cable, but on other systems there will be considerable variance in that. So that's uh, earth loop impedance testing. And uh, it is part of a series on testing, so if you haven't seen the rest of this series, then 
links to that in the description and wherever. And until next time, thanks for watching.